Chapter 16. Then began a curious phase in their lives. Borrowings beyond all dreams of borrowing. A golden age. Every night the floor was opened and treasures would appear. A real carpet for the sitting room. A tiny coal scuttle. A stiff little sofa with damask cushions. A double bed with a round bolster. A single ditto with a striped mattress. Framed pictures instead of stamps. A kitchen stove which didn't work but which looked lovely in the kitchen. There were oval tables and square tables and a little desk with one drawer. There were two maple wardrobes, one with a looking glass. And a bureau with curved legs. Homily grew not only accustomed to the roof coming off, but even went so far as to suggest to Pod that he put the board on hinges. It's just the hammering. I don't care for it, she explained. It brings down my dirt. When the boy brought them a grand piano, Homily begged Pod to build a drawing room. Next to the sitting room, she said. And we can move the storerooms farther down. Then we can have those gilt chairs he talks about and the palm in a pot. Pod, however, was a little tired of the furniture removing. He was looking forward to the quiet evenings when he could doze at last beside the fire in his new velvet chair. No sooner had he put a chest of drawers in one place when Homily, coming in and out of the door to get the effect, made him try it somewhere else. And every evening, at about his usual bedtime, the roof would fly up and more stuff would arrive. But Homily was tireless, bright-eyed and pink-cheeked after a long day's pushing and pulling. She would still leave nothing until morning. Let's just try it, she would beg lifting up one end of a large doll sideboard so that Pod would have to lift the other. It won't take a minute. But as Pod well knew, in actual fact it would be several hours before, dishevelled and aching, they finally dropped into bed. Even then, Homily would sometimes hop out to have one last look. In the meantime, in payment for these riches, Arietti would read to the boy every afternoon in the long grass beyond the cherry tree. He would lie on his back and she would stand beside his shoulder and tell him when to turn the page. They were happy days to look back on afterwards, with the blue sky beyond the cherry boughs, the grasses softly stirring and the boy's great ear listening beside her. She grew to know that ear quite well, with its curves and shadows and sunlit pinks and golds. Sometimes, as she grew bolder, she would lean against his shoulder. He was very still while she read to him and always grateful. What worlds they would explore together. Strange worlds to Arietti. She learned a lot and some of the things she learned were hard to accept. She was made to realise once and for all that this earth on which they lived, turning about in space, did not revolve, as she had believed, for the sake of little people, nor for big people either. She reminded the boy when she saw his secret smile. In the cool of the evening, Pod would come for her, a rather weary Pod, dishevelled and dusty, to take her back for tea. And at home there'd be an excited homily and fresh delights to discover. Shut your eyes, homily would cry. Now open them, and Arietti, in a dream of joy, would see her home transformed. All kinds of surprises there were. Even one day, lace curtains at the grating looped up with pink string. Their only sadness was that there was no one there to see. No visitors, no casual drop-ins, no admiring cries and envious glances. What would Homily have not given for an overmantle or a harpsichord? Even a rain barrel would have been better than no one at all. You write to your Uncle Hendreary, Homily suggested, and tell him. A nice long letter, mind, and don't leave anything out. Arietti began the letter on the back of one of the discarded pieces of blotting paper, but it became, as she wrote it, just a dull list, far too long, like a sale catalogue or the inventory of a house to let. She would have to keep jumping up to count spoons or to look up words in the dictionary, and after a while she laid it aside. There was so much else to do. So many new books to read and so much now that she could talk of with the boy. 
He's been ill, she told her mother and father. He's been here for the quiet and the country air, but soon he'll go back to India. Did you know, she asked the amazed homily, that the Arctic night lasts six months and that the distance between the two poles is less than that between the two extremities of a diameter drawn through the equator? Yes, they were happy days, and all would have been well, as Pod said afterwards, if they'd stuck to borrowing from the doll's house. No one in the human household seemed to remember it was there, and consequently nothing was missed. The drawing room, however, could not help but be a temptation. It was so seldom used nowadays. There were so many knick-knack tables which had been out of Pod's reach, and the boy, of course, could turn the key in the glass doors of the cabinet. The silver violin he brought them first, and then the silver harp. It stood no higher than Pod's shoulder, and Pod restrung it with horsehair from the sofa in the morning room. A musical conversazione! That's what we could have! cried the exulting homily as Arietti struck a tiny, tuneless note on a horsehair string. If only, she went on fervently, clasping her hands, your father would start on the drawing room. She curled her hair nearly every evening nowadays, and since the house was more or less straight, she would occasionally change for dinner into a satin dress. It hung like a sack, but homily called it Grecian. We could use your painted ceiling, she explained to Arietti. And there are quite enough of those toy builders' bricks to make a parquet floor. Parquet, she would say, parquet. Just like a harpsichord. Even Great Aunt Sophie, right away upstairs in the littered grandeur of her bedroom, seemed distantly affected by a spirit of endeavour which seemed to flow in gleeful whirls and eddies about the staid old house. Several times lately, Pod, when he went to her room, had found her out of bed. He went there nowadays not to borrow, but to rest. The room, one might almost say, had become his club, a place to which he could go to get away from things. Pod was a little irked by his riches he had never visualised, not in his wildest dreams borrowing such as this. Homily, he felt, should call a halt surely now, their home was grand enough. These jewelled snuff boxes and diamond encrusted miniatures, these filigree vanity cases and Dresden figurines, all as he knew from the drawing room cabinet, were not really necessary. What was the good of a shepherdess nearly as tall as Arietti or an outsized candle snuffer? Sitting just inside the fender where he could warm his hands at the fire, he watched Aunt Sophie hobble slowly around the room on her two sticks. She'll be downstairs soon. Shouldn't wonder, he thought glumly, hardly listening to her oft-told tale about a royal luncheon aboard a Russian yacht. Then she'll miss these things. It was not Aunt Sophie, however, who missed them first. It was Mrs Driver. Mrs Driver had never forgotten the trouble over Rosa Pitcatchet. It had not been, at the time, easy to pinpoint the guilt. Even Crampfell had felt under suspicion. From now on, Mrs Driver had said, I'll manage on my own. No more strange maids in this house. A drop of Madeira here, a pair of old stockings there, a handkerchief or so, an odd vest or an occasional pair of gloves. These, Mrs Driver felt, were different. These were within her rights. Her trinkets out of the drawing room cabinet. That, she told herself grimly, staring at the depleted shelves was a different story altogether. Standing there on that fateful day, in the spring sunshine, feather duster in her hand, her little black eyes had become slits of anger and cunning. She felt tricked. It was, she calculated, as though someone, suspecting her dishonesty, were trying to catch her out. So who could it be? Crampfell? That boy? The man who came to wind the clocks? These things had disappeared gradually one by one. It was someone, of that she felt sure, who knew the house. 
and someone who wished her ill. Could it, she wondered suddenly, be the mistress herself? The old girl had been out of bed lately and walking about her room. Might she not have come downstairs in the night, poking about with her stick, snooping and spying? Mrs Driver remembered suddenly the empty Madeira bottle and the two glasses, which so often were left on the kitchen table. Ah, thought Mrs Driver. Was not this just, just the sort of thing she might do? The sort of thing she would cackle over, back upstairs again amongst her pillows, watching and waiting for Mrs Driver to report the loss. Everything all right downstairs, Mrs Driver? That's what she'd always say, and she would look at Mrs Driver sideways out of those mocking old eyes of her. I wouldn't put it past her, Mrs Driver exclaimed aloud, gripping her feather duster as though it were a club. And a nice merry Andrew she'd look if I caught her at it, creeping about the downstairs rooms in the middle of the night. All right, my lady, muttered Mrs Driver grimly. Pry and potter all you want. Two can play at that game. 